So we have been talking with legal expert Jackie Lipton, and now I would like to talk with literary agent Jackie Lipton. And I have some very specific questions as someone who would like to find an agent in the next year, and then some general questions because we have such an interesting mix of traditionally published and self-published authors, authors for adults, authors for children and young adults on the call. Um, But before we do that, Jackie, can you just give us a quick snapshot of sort of where you are in your literary agent experience and kind of how you run Raven Quill? Yeah, yeah. So I, um, like all the other agents, there's four agents at Raven Quill, and we started as an agency at the beginning of 2020, in January 2020, when several of us were leaving other agencies and well, we were all leaving other agencies, but some were coming as interns and from internships and some came from agents. Uh, as agents, Courtney was an agent at a couple of other agencies. I was at another agency as an agent. Um, and then Laurie and Kelly had been interns and assistants. So we all had a lot of experience, but we came together as like the thing Um last year right before the pandemic which actually worked in our favor because we're virtual we uh, all live in different places and we didn't have to do any pivoting so all our friends who are agents in New York they had to figure out what to do with their offices in New York and because they all had existing uh, contracts with book deals being cancelled and postponed I had a couple of book deals from the previous year that were postponed but none got cancelled so we actually did pretty well last year you know we made a lot of sales we didn't have a lot of expenses <laughs> it worked out really well um but it started out really and it predominantly still is a uh, kid lit agency so it's predominantly picture book through young adult but I also rep adult genre because I myself write and work in um adult genre areas and because you know I wanted new challenges and and stuff like that so I have adult mystery writers um what have I got adult I've got people doing adult mystery thriller uh romance you know to a variety of of that sort of thing um sci-fi I've got a sci-fi author um what else what else do we want to know I don't know what we want to know well, let's just start with the with the beginning. Um, so you share with us from a literary agent perspective, what happens when you receive a query letter? Cool. Yeah, I think we, we like a lot of other agencies because we all came from other agencies. Um, so we all have interns and readers, but we, as far as I know, yeah, we all read all the queries. So uh, we all have a really terrific team of readers and interns, but usually we're using them for a second opinion on something. I read everything in my inbox and I know everyone else does too. We're not always all open to queries because we do read everything in, in our inboxes. I actually, you know what, I'm going to put in the chat. I have a I have a uh, invited submissions window that is always open, but people don't know what it is because it's my query manager box with invited at the end, like it's so hard to guess, Um, but I'm just not usually open to general submissions because I have to run the agency too. I have to do the accounting stuff and the legal stuff and, you know, I can't be spending all my life reading millions of queries. We do share, so we all know what each other likes. So if I get a manuscript that, is I'm, I'm really not great at funny animal books. It's just not my thing. Courtney is fantastic at it. So if I get one of those, I usually say, hey, Courtney, do you want to look at this one? Um, other agents send a lot of the sci-fi stuff to me because I tend to be the one who likes sci-fi. Uh, we're all very, very committed to uh, raising underrepresented voices and new perspectives. And you know, obviously I've got a huge feminist bent as well. Um, so, you know, it's very competitive. I mean, our, we started last year, our lists are all pretty full. 
this year we're doing we you know we're sort of consolidating we we talked about at the end of at the end of the year we talked about do we want to expand do we want to bring on new agents do we want our lists to get bigger or smaller and we you know we really don't we want to actually expand in other areas i'm doing some film tv stuff and a couple of the other agents are expanding sort of the foreign rights part so we so this year for us is somewhat of a consolidation which doesn't mean we're not accepting clients but I think if anyone was following our Twitter last week there was really a flurry of signing clients because you know Laurie started taking clients halfway through the year and she took a lot of people quickly I weirdly signed two or three people in December that just I just had these just happenstance three amazing authors who uh, I just couldn't not offer to but I think for all of us, we all, we always say like, we don't want your fastest work. We want your best and most polished work because it is so competitive. And we know that we don't, we're all very editorial. So, you know, we, we don't expect client work to be ready to go out on submission, but we do, you know, we're not looking at people's first drafts. We do want to see polished work. But if we like something, so if I really have someone in my inbox that I really think I would be a good fit with and I really want to work with. Um, I discuss, we all, always discuss it amongst the four of us. We never take on a client without all four, you know, because sometimes someone knows someone about something, you know, like we, we have had situations where, okay, we have, a, we, we've had situations where someone says, oh, I had this really awful experience with this guy and probably don't work with them. Um, it's happened once or twice. Usually it's pretty obvious, like if someone's going to be a pain in the butt to work with, usually their reputation precedes them before we get to the point of, hey, I'd like to offer rep. Um, well, well, hold on. Like, so to, what is a pain in the butt to work with? We're recording, aren't we? Darn it. We but, are. <laughs> we have but we to want say, to know because none of us wants to be a pain yeah. in the butt. So tell us. No, you wouldn't be. No, my client, um, who you know, Monica Rowe from BCFA, she was my very first client. When I started agenting, I, I knew I wanted to rep Monica because I'd actually helped her in an agent search a year previously. And she um, ended up not signing with an agent because she had a baby. And so I, I contacted her and said, did you sign with an agent? Because I'd really like to. So anyway, she has this running joke with me about um, this book she wants me to write about these clients who are pains in the butt because they're, okay, usually they're white guys. Usually they're white guys writing something wildly out of their lane, like something that they have no business writing. Um, and usually they're just incredibly obnoxious and pushy and the work isn't there and it's pretty, you know, so you'll you'll reject a piece and the next day they'll send another piece and the next day and they haven't read our submission guidelines, which say, please wait. And they're, they're it, it, people, people who don't, do, you know, do the research, don't know, who, who either don't do the research and don't know how to write a professional letter and think that they're the most important person in the world and you're there to serve them or people who do do the research but think that they're an exception and so it it, it tends to be people who are sort of obnoxious and and people who who you know don't treat us or anyone professionally we have not faced the situation that some other agencies have uh, with problematic, you know, clients who write problematic stuff or who engage in problematic behaviour because you, you'll all see, particularly in KidLit, KidLit is on Twitter all the time voicing their opinions about everything. Um, and anyone who follows KidLit Twitter sees that there are situations that have arisen where a client has been let go from an agency or somewhere an agent's been let go from an agency actually um, because of bad behavior. We haven't faced that. And I know that I have friends who have been in agencies where situations have come up where there's a client who's really problematic or they're considering taking on a client who has the reputation for being really problematic, um, but also the potential to make a lot of money. I think because we're so young and so new, we haven't face that I like that we're so collaborative that I think if we ever do face it um you know we'll do it 
in a supportive way. We won't, none of us would make a decision that would upset anyone else. I mean, it's my agency and I tend to always ask for everyone's opinion before I make any decision that would affect any anyone else. So yeah, so none of you would be, <laughs> none of you would be problematic clients. It's, it's just, get onto Kidlit Twitter and you'll see what I mean. Okay, Maybe. Kidlit Twitter. We will, we will, those of us, especially in the, in the Kidlit world, will follow that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I, we obviously, we have, so I have a two-part question. We have authors who have self-published here. We have authors who have agents. I would like to know, um, so give me your sales pitch for why I should have an agent rather than self-publish. And then the second part of that is if I have self-published, is it possible for me to find an agent at some point and, and publish traditionally? Tell me where we for are the, with for that. The same book, for the same book or for a different book? I, you tell me, okay. what are we, where are we? Okay. Same book. I mean, because same book is much trickier because same book, if you've self-published it, you then can't give a traditional publisher right of first publication, which they want because you've already published it. And the fact that it's been out there and an agent or a publisher haven't picked it up already, um, what might seem to you to be really solid sales figures are not solid sales, uh, are potentially not solid sales figures um, in, you know, traditional publishing terms. So I'll, I'll often have people saying, I've self-published this and I've sold 300 copies and, you know, the, you should take this and sell it to, you know, Simon & Schuster. It's like, that's not a lot of copies for them. You know, for self-published, it's great. Um, but to sort of flip back to the beginning of that, I think it really depends on the book, you know, whether you need an agent or not. And I, you know, as an agent, I have clients who do both. I have clients who navigate hybrid careers and we often talk about, you know, would this be a good one to self-publish or should we try traditional publishing? You know, one of my clients is a tremendously successful self-published author who has been previously agented and traditionally published. Um, she then left her agent, became, I mean, she makes more money self-publishing than, like a lot of traditional publishing contracts. And she, you know, so a lot of her projects, we, we decide, well, shall we send this out or not? Do you want a tradition? Cause I, you know, she knows she can make money self-publishing. Um, but even with self-published works that are successful, there's foreign rights, there's audio rights, there's other stuff agents can, can help with. I never tell a, I, I have those discussions a lot with, with my clients, right? about would this be good to self-publish because there are real advantages to self-publishing certain things um, and it's very very project specific but if you're the step earlier if you're saying well you know I have this thing I don't know if I want an agent for it or not that's a slightly different question because you're assuming that the agent will go the traditional publishing route with you. So what you're really asking yourself is, is this a book I want to control 100% or is this a book I want an agent to try and traditionally publish? And if you don't know, if you're on the fence, I would maybe suggest querying an agent because you haven't lost anything. You know, if the agent tries to sell the book and can't, you can still self-publish. Whereas if you self-publish first and it's not wildly successful, it's much harder to take that project and traditionally publish it. You could take another project and traditionally publish it. Um, Jackie, so, you, yeah. you used a phrase called right of first publication. That sounds like a term of art. Can you explain uh, what that means? Yeah. Um, and it's actually, I'm, I guess I'm using it a little bit incorrectly anyway. I'm using it as a shorthand. They just, they want to be the first person. They want to control the first publication of the work. So, I mean, yes, I think the term right of first publication is a little archaic now because I don't see it used in contracts, but that's what the contracts mean. They just mean we want to control the audience that first sees the book. And we might license that to someone else. Right. And that's in the contract, but we don't want you 
you know. The reason I ask is I had never heard that before. So. Yeah, it, it is a legal term. It is a term of art. Um, it is used less now than when I started working in this area, which, you know, now that I think of it, I say it more than other people do, but it means the same thing. So, so for example, you see a lot of querying authors who put the first chapter of their book on their website, like, don't do that. Because I just, I just... I just saw this in a discussion book with the women in publishing um, thing that I follow on social media where somebody asked, I'm querying, but I'd like to go ahead and, and release the first three chapters of the book to, to continue to grow my following, which is a follow on question about mm -hmm. your platform when you're, when you're marketing yourself to agents and, and you're following, how do you grow that or how important is that to an agent? But yeah, th there's this discussion about, well, there were a lot of people like, like no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't publish your work. <laughs> don't, no, seriously. don't put it out there. Yeah. No, because, I mean, there's lots of reasons not to do it. The legal reason is you, you can't give your first publication rights to, your publisher if you're already publishing the thing it's and if you really think you're going to grow an audience with your own work then self-publish it you know grow your audience say I have this tremendous following for my self-published work and now I'm querying this other project and my readers are going to want to see it so if if that's how you're trying to grow your readership then publish the book and write something else to query I would say, I mean, not everyone agrees, but that's what I would say. But I think there's lots of ways to grow a following um, without publishing your work on your website. I think it looks um, unprofessional. You know, I think it looks like someone said, oh, people will see how wonderful your work is, but if everyone is doing that, no one's going to read it anyway. I just, I am more impressed I mean, I hate Twitter, like I hate it and I loathe it and I'm on it purely professionally, not socially. Um, but a lot of people connect on Twitter. A lot of people do these, you know, pitch events on Twitter, which I also think are stupid, but sometimes I, because I'm old, whatever. Um, so I think a lot of people don't even have websites but are kind of on Twitter and are following people and are participating in the conversation. I think like I notice authors who are participating in the conversation on Twitter. Um, I notice professional queries in my inbox. I like it if someone has a website and they may be reviewing other people's books because that shows they like the market, they know the market. Uh, they're involved in the market. If people have on their website or their blog, they're talking about conferences or webinars they went to. I think what I want to see is that you're engaged in the industry. I don't want to see your actual writing unless it's in my inbox. You know, unless you're someone like Trisha, my client, who's this self-publishing megastar, because that's how that's how she engages. She does school visits. She makes a ton of money. She has thousands of reviews, you know, and it's, it's amazing, but it's really, really hard to do that because everyone's trying to do it. And it's much easier to say, hey, I'm just participating in this conversation. I'm just really interested. I mean, I'm a, I'm, sometimes I get a little, I was a little creepy this weekend. Sometimes I get a little creepy on Twitter and I'm following an interesting conversation and I'll reach out to the person and say, wow, that was a really interesting thing you said, Are you, you know, when you're querying, let me know because I'd actually like to look at because I'm interested in the discussion they're having about their work. I don't know if they're going to be a good writer, but I have no obligation to offer them representation. I'm just interested in what they're saying. That's just me too. This is all subjective. So when you refer to those Twitter pictures, are you talking about Pit Mad? <laughs> oh, there's tons of them. crazy. That's crazy. I've, I've picked, but you know, I don't I don't look at those because I'm not going to compete with a hundred other agents. Like right. Courtney, Courtney Price at my agency does this. She's young, she doesn't have a family, she has time. And she and all her young agent friends at other agencies, they're all fighting over these books. They're literally playing among us and fighting over <laughs> these books. Um, but there are less than like this week was like hive pitch, which I've never heard of. 
but I was actually following this hive pitch thing, which is new. There's, there's going to be later this year an Asian and Pacific Islander pitch thing. I sometimes pop into some of those because they're less frenetic. They're less, and I can actually follow the, I Seriously, I can't follow, you know, because I've, I've got multifocals. I've got tired old eyes. I can't follow these huge, but if it's a contained discussion, like, like the one that I just fell into on Friday, I'm like, oh, this is actually quite interesting. And there's people here from Europe and I'm getting a perspective of, you know, what they're writing in Europe. And I was just interested in it. So I am not saying, yeah, everyone has to do pit mad because, you know, it's, I, it's great. People get big agents and they get big deals and it's just not my personal cup of tea. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Sid or Sarah, both self-published authors. Do you guys have any questions for Jackie as a literary agent? I mean, people are looking for agents. I, I actually just wrote a column for Lunar Station Quarterly on red flags in agent contracts. So I can certainly give you all the warnings. So I mean, I, I actually have a question about self-publishing, um, if you don't mind, since yeah. nobody is, is, Liz, is that okay? I know you, you specifically asked for Sarah or Sid. I don't want to cut either of you off. Go. Okay. Um, I am published by a company called Acorn Publishing. They are a hybrid publisher. They will call themselves a hybrid publisher. By contract, on both of my books, they have no right to any of my work. I hold all of the rights. They receive no royalties. Mm -hmm. um, they bought they bought the ISBNs, and they let me and, and I use their um, you know their imprint. And they did curate the books. Obviously, they wouldn't have taken them if they were didn't meet their standards, whatever those standards are. Am I considered a self published author? All right, I'm going to throw a question back at you. Why does it matter? Oh, it doesn't. I'm, 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 it's, it's, it's purely semantics, Jackie. Because I, um, I mean, I think there's so many of these companies doing variations of this. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it is because um, I, I remember uh, talking to someone about maybe getting an agent for my third book, the third book in the series. And somebody said, well, you know, you're, if you're, if you have a publisher that has rights in the book, no one will take the series and if you're self-published no one will take the series and I'm like well it, it isn't exactly either way and it not sure it matters if anyone oh. takes the series or not so I and that's why I asked you because I, I think there might be some confusion uh, in the no, market I, about what no, is and isn't publishable no I see what you're talking about but I actually think that's more about it's the third book in a series regardless of right I, I and that's true too and that's yeah. true too you know I, I, I mean I didn't I, I'm perfectly happy um, with with the way my first two books went out and how well they've done and and if the third one goes out exactly the same way I would be happy with that but you know also being an attorney and liking to put labels on things <laughs> no I know I know exactly what you mean and I actually have clients in that position like trying to move series between editors like they publish with a small press and they want to move to a big press um and it's really hard to do because the agent wants to get the shiny new thing out because the editor wants the shiny new thing out so i think wherever you are in a trilogy or a series unless it's just wildly successful and people are already calling you and fighting over it I do think it's better, I think you have two options. You can either pretend it's not the third book in the series. You can either just pitch it as a standalone and just not, you know, and just say, here's a book or you can finish it and then pitch the next thing. But I think when you're asking someone to come in in the middle of a series, it's really tough. And you're right that one of the questions is about rights, but I've found that's not the main question. Like I am in that situation with authors who've started series with small publishers who do not have rights in the next, you know, they only had rights in the books they bought um, and we could get the rights back and we could repackage them and whatever. But the publishers don't want that. They want, no, they want, they like the author, but they want her to write something new. And that, and, and that is, thank you. May, may I just tell you how 
long I have tried to get an answer to the question, and now I finally have one. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. This is this has been, I, I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've, I've been treading through the Sahara, desperately seeking the answer to this question, which I now have. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a, I don't think it's a legal question at all. I think it's a market question. And uh, that, so that is the answer. I thought of a question. Yeah. Um, I, I heard that um, it takes a minimum of 70 grand to promote a new book, to, just to get the word out that it exists. Yeah. And um, so I'm wondering what, um, what, what's the state of the industry right now with advances in traditional publishing? I mean, I think it's pretty much all over the place, which is where it's always been. Um, one, th one thing you can look at if you want a sense of this is, remember, did you see the whole publishing paid me thing last year and they someone compiled an excel spreadsheet of the genres and the, yeah. the so that actually whether or not you're looking at at it as a underrepresented voices issue it actually does give you a nice lowdown of what advances were in different genres during a particular time period what is it called where do you find, it's the thing the movement was it's called publishing paid. publishing paid me if you google publishing paid me you'll find this uh, i found an article that just kind of it kind of like uh gives you the ranges of both traditionally published and like an idea of what self-published authors are making depending on their book and genre and great like thanks it's sort of a double-edged sword because then I have clients saying, well, this person got a seven-figure deal. It's like, yes, but you're not going to. So, you know, whatever. But um, I mean, the interesting thing is because books are just so um, speculative, you know, and so when you talk to editors, I mean, I've, I'm friends with a lot of editors at like big top big five houses or big four houses in the next year, um, possibly big three, who knows? But it's like, how do you know the book's worth, you know, the, the advance is worth $50,000? It's like, because I say so. You know, that is the answer. It is it is totally, um, you know, they'll have guidelines of, well, the last X, Y, Z that was similar, we paid this much. But if the agent comes in aggressively and says, no, we want this, and there's another publisher interested, it really, there's no... And, you know, often with my clients, I try and be really realistic about those advances because you have to earn them out, right? So, right. Last, That's what, last, that was going to be my question because yeah. I've heard different advice about, as an author, what should I be concerned about in terms of advances? And it's like, well, you know, I, I, I have questions about this because so if some if a publishing house pays me a bigger advance does that mean they're going to work harder at marketing my no. book so it so might. my book's got to sell so like why would i take why would i even accept a big that's so much pressure you know <laughs> like why would i even right. accept a big advance and people don't get that you know that's this is there's this disconnect when people see dollar signs and it's like you know chances are the publisher has every intention of putting the marketing behind it if they're paying that much but who knows what's going to happen the editor could leave the budget could change another book could come along that they want to i mean they're not i mean we always ask when we are dealing with decent sized advances we always talk to the acquiring editor and say well what sort of you know pr are you realistically putting behind this they will never put it in the contract. They'll tell us, well, you know, you can be assured that we'll put it, you know, we'll promote it here and we'll do this. And this is how we usually do these campaigns. And then I, as an attorney say, how much of that can we get in the contract? And it's like, none of it. We're yeah. not gonna put any of it in the contract. Um, so can, you, can you provide, I am so fascinated by this. Can you provide a ballpark? Let's say just for purposes of discussion, you sell a book to my, my fiction book, my women's fiction book, for, and I get a $20,000 advance. How many copies does that have to sell to earn out? Roughly, roughly. I mean, a lot of that depends on format as well. So you would have to sell, I mean, so hard, hard copy paperback 
an ebook, I guess you'd want to be selling. Laurie does the math so much better than me. Eight, eight to ten thousand, probably. That's a that's a lot of books. <laughs> it's a lot of books. If you sold the audio rights and to someone else, I had that happen last year. We did such a good deal on the audio rights that we but it wasn't us, it was the publisher. It basically paid off the advance on the print copies. So everything after that. So if you sell um, sub rights or foreign rights and you credit that to the advance, that's usually how it earns out unless it's a huge blockbuster. Like for example, on this book, I mean, I'll, we're recording, but I, I got a advance that wasn't $20,000, <laughs> it was less than $20,000. Um, I would be very surprised if this earns out its advance because it's a it's a niche. Specialty, specialty. Very specialty. And it was very hard to get a publisher um, for that reason. The two black marks against me going out on submission with this, and it was the final editor in the third round that bought it. Um, Two black marks. One, I didn't have a huge platform. Like I'm a, I'm a known law professor, but that doesn't make me like a celebrity. You know, I don't have like 10,000 followers on Twitter. And the market is authors who are interested in law. So it's that little bit where the two cross over. It's, you know, it, it's not even all writers. And of course you say, but all writers want a copy of this, but they don't. Right. So, um, yeah. So I remember doing that exact calculation on my book and saying, because my agent, I mean, seriously, I've finished the second book, the option book on this contract, which does have a broader market because it's not for writers, it's just for the general public. Um, and she came in and she was like, we want a $30,000 advance. And they just said, nope. And they said, you know, you're going to have five. <laughs> it's like they settled in the middle. But, and that, you know, that book, that's a, about sort of um, a consumer guide to data, digital data privacy, right? So that is something that I think has a broader market than a. That theoretically could earn out, although the problem with that book is it goes out of date in five minutes. This book, um, the first printing, I think, was 3,000 copies, and that would barely make a dent by the time, you know, because I'm only getting a tiny percentage on each one sold. So if you've been paid in advance on a book that has not earned out, do you not get royalties until the book right. earns out? Yeah, right. okay. I'm sorry, Liz, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that was a good question, too. Um, my question, I just lost it for my advances royalties audio rights foreign rights i i have a question oh, so, oh go Jenny. no go I, ahead mine came back but you go okay but it might take it a little bit in a different direction so if you have like to wrap up the royalty i don't know i don't want to go in another direction with okay hold your question so mine is uh it's very specific to children and young adults you just mentioned that your first printing of of this book was about three thousand copies yeah. what is an average like number of copies for a traditionally sold ya book? it depends on the book and the publisher um sure. You know, some of them are two, three thousand. If it's going to be one that they think they're really going to, you know, they put a bigger advance in and they're going to send a lot more copies out, um, it could get closer to, I guess, five. I mean, I guess with Angeline Bully's book, you know, that hit the New York Times, the one that just came out, seven figure advance, I mean, they probably printed thousands and thousands of those because they threw so much money behind that. Um, I know with my clients who've worked with sort of the, the mid-sized publishers, it's been two to 3,000 per print. And bear in mind that they can order a second printing very quickly now, because what happens, I actually got to do a tour of one of these printing uh, companies because there's one an hour away from where I live, like one of the big uh, companies that works for all of the publishing companies. 
and it's all digital now. So they, you know, you can put in an order for 2000 more copies and get it done very, very quickly now because everything's in the digital files at the printing warehouse and they just have to, I mean, it's a little more complex than pressing a button. They have to have all the right paper stock and the right ink and everything, but they can do it really quickly now. Okay, Jenny, what's yours? Maybe Sarah has a question. Sorry, mine was still kind of on this and I just wanted to make sure that I like understood you correctly. So you were and kind of got the bottom line. If you're thinking between self-publishing versus an agent and you're already published, um, would you say it's fair that unless you have a following or a reader where the book is already selling um, itself that you probably wouldn't want to look for an agent? For that book? Yeah, like that does, I guess, the reason I would think that I would want an agent would be to be able to tell more people about my book No, and it for the marketing. Well. And it's not no, like that, right? That's not what literary agents do. You would want a publicity person. You'd, you'd want, and there's lots of free, really good freelance publicity and marketing people. But if you're, an agent sells work to traditional publishers. An agent doesn't do, I mean, my agency, we do stuff because we like small and close knit, but that's not our job. That's not what we get paid for. Um, what you're talking about is a publicity campaign. It's not cheap. I talk a little bit about it in my book, uh, in, in the chapter on self-published stuff that you're sort of contracting then. I, I talked just, I actually considered hiring uh, someone who was recommended to me for my book and she cut me a break because it's such a niche book. And in the end, well, COVID hit too, but in the end it was, she still said it's probably more, she was going to charge me $5,000 for a sort of a scaled down version of what she would usually do because the market would be so niche. But all the stuff she was going to do was stuff I could have done anyway. And, you know, she wasn't obviously going to reach out to the Today Show for a book. So... Um, I do have names of recommended PR freelance people who have good reputations. They're not cheap, but you know, that that's, I think what you're talking about. Well, yeah. If I, could... I spent a few thousand on publicity for both of my books and it was probably the best money I spent. Who did you, I mean, did you use a person or did you use? I, a... Used, a, I used a person who's local here in Southern California um, and whose expertise is in local media um, and, you know, I got on live TV, I got in the San Diego Union Tribune, I've, I've been on radio all over the country. So uh, has it sold books? Has it earned out? No. Well, actually, Robin, I found out about Fly Girl and I was sitting in Cambodia. So it worked. <gasps> It worked. There you go. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Like, um, I'm there, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jen. Seriously, like I didn't know anything about. Obviously, my interest on Facebook is set to aviation, right? And I also run a huge aviation social media page. Huge. It reaches 25, 30 million people per month. So um, everything is set to aviation. But so your you must have had a paid Facebook or somebody had promoted yep. you, yep. But, but my, like there was like a week or two there where it was fly girl, fly girl, fly girl, fly girl. And then I was just like, oh, wow. And then I learned about you. And then I started posting your content on my Facebook. And this Gosh. is like 15,000 kilometers away, right? I'm so far from California. I don't even know what to say. And, and this was, and this was the publicist. So thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to actually, her name is, is Jennifer also, All right. <laughs> and I'm going to tell Jen uh, yeah. what you just said, you. because it, it, it was so expensive, and, and I, I, I agonized over it, and I thought, no, to give it any chance at all. Yeah, no, seriously. Yeah. Like when I, I have a Facebook aviation, Facebook page, actually it's related to my peace and socioeconomic work. I started in 2016 in Cambodia and I invested in it as well. And uh, I, I created animated cartoons about, you know, how does an aircraft fly and different jobs in aviation. I put a lot of soul, money and soul. And now like X amount of years later, um, it is, I'm, I, we reach 30, 35, 40 million per month. Can you imagine all these messages we get from people all over the world? 
that's, so that's extraordinary. And, and I appreciate you saying that because I think a lot of authors and Jackie, tell me if I'm not right about this. They think that the minute they get a traditional publisher, that's it. Yep. They don't have to do anything. Yep. They don't have to spend anything. They just sit there and let the money roll in. It's not just not the way it works. So give Sarah the name of your pick because that's what she needs. Yeah, that's my problem. I'll, you know, people who've bought my book will tell me, oh, it's my child's favorite book. They sleep with it. We read it every day for eight months. And it's like, well, did you tell anybody to buy it? Well, no. Yeah. Or did no. you review it on Amazon or did you? Yeah, yeah none. Yeah. I, that's you, definitely where I need help. Jackie, can you talk about reviews for us? Because um, I have been like, on this campaign, telling everybody in the book club, make sure you review your books on yeah. Amazon, on Goodreads. Tell us from your perspective, what influence that has over book sales. Uh, it's weird. I mean, I don't know. Well, no, I publishers are looking at it because I know my publisher looks at it and they're, you know, trade arm of a university press yeah publishers do look at it um and you know the different goodreads versus amazon they have different reputations so like what is it like a three on goodreads is like a five on amazon that's that sort of thing with the stars yeah people do look at i mean i think with self-publishing it's really important because that's kind of Oh, Robin just put her publicist in there. So everyone write that down. Um, I think if you're self-publishing, it's really important because I think a lot of purchases, I mean, I do, like we all do it. We all look at, I look at the reviews, um, but it's perverse in the sense that it really doesn't mean anything because so often people can pay, you can pay to get those reviews. Amazon tries to stop that from happening. Um, one bad review can, overtake a whole you know if you don't have a lot of reviews you never know what's motivating bad reviews like uh kelly dykster house and i worked for the same agent we interned for the same agent and occasionally the eight we had to do little campaigns um the readers and our friends would do campaigns to try and redress something that had happened on goodreads and it appeared to be like a negative review that wasn't really even by someone who had read the book, but it might have been, you, you never know why. So, so yeah, it's hard for me to answer that question because I, it, it's all part of how Amazon just has more power than they should. And I think more so than Goodreads. I think Goodreads is maybe more credible, but it's the Amazon reviews that everyone looks at. So yeah, you should be doing that. But you know, it's it's perverse because it doesn't mean anything. It's yet another one of those things that doesn't mean anything. Jenny, you had a question in there somewhere. Yes, okay. Um, maybe this isn't the, maybe I don't know the role of a literary agent actually, as you had mentioned to Sarah when you had said about promotion, but um, beyond aerospace, I've had a lot of different work published all over the world in literary magazines. And sometimes like I'll fly to a country and I'll tell the editor, um, oh, I'm in Northern Laos and you know, this might be the story and I don't really know how it's gonna develop, but would you be interested in this, right? Here I am, this is like, let's say North Korean refugees are gonna be streaming through this road. I'm on this road. I've been sitting on this road for three weeks, four weeks. Would you like to have a story out of this? And then I've worked with the editor to create that story. And then sometimes I've published and then sometimes I'm, I'm like, well, maybe that's just not for me to tell this story. And sorry, I'm not going to go ahead with this story. But I, over the years, I've been able to kind of work with magazine, literary yep. magazines. Yep. Um, would I be able to do that in a book publishing uh, world as opposed to the literary ma magazine world? We're like where you're pitching yeah. an idea, but you haven't written it yet. Is that what you mean? Yeah, basically, like ba basically, yeah. Like I would, yeah, basically. I'm, I've got this idea. This is my insight. These are my connections. This is who I'm with. These are the other scholars I'm around. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, you know, blah blah blah. Can I, is there is it possible to find somebody to walk me through that process and not just like 
yeah, this is the idea, but it could take one year, two years, three years. Is that something or is that? Yeah, it's so the analog to um, magazine pitching is proposal pitching. Like you pitch a proposal through your agent to uh, publishers and that's very, that's how nonfiction is, is sold. Um, you, you have to have, unless you're going to work with a, ghostwriter you really do have to have a proposal I mean if you're really famous sure you can go to you usually just go to the publisher and say hey I want to do this and they'll help you find a ghostwriter for it but if you want to actually just pitch it as you writing it you need to know how to write a non-fiction proposal that would grab the editor's attention the agent's attention and then the agent can pitch it to editors that's actually that's what this was you know, uh -huh. I was like, I'm a law professor and a graduate of a writing program and I've done some writing and it's become obvious to me that, the, that there's a gap in the information that's available and people need to know this and I can make a case for why that's something. I can pitch that. I can say, so I had to learn how to write a nonfiction pitch. And for that purpose, I'm going to put in the chat this book, um, Thinking Like Your Editor by Susan Rabiner, who is herself a nonfiction agent and runs her own agency. This is like the Bible of how to write that kind of pitch for, for an agent. It's older. It's an older book, so it's pre-digital, but the content is the same. It's just you would email it now instead of putting it in the post. Um, so I was ab able to do that. And then I got my agents and then she helped me polish it for submission to editors. Um, so actually her website has a, some really good info on that too. And it's not as bad as you would think. Let me put, this is just um, the digital website has on their submission guidelines. They have a really handy, and you don't have to be their client. It's just on their website, a uh, really handy guide to how to write a good nonfiction proposal. And basically, you just need to say, you know, here's what this thing is about. Here's why it's important. Here's who I am. Here's why I'm the person to write it. You have to usually write a sample chapter, write a little bit about the market that would be interested in buying it. They're usually 30 to 50 pages long, double spaced. So it's like writing a scholarly article. Um, but that's how you would go about that. Um, okay, so it is kind of similar to like a nonfiction, yeah, yeah. What, like you had said, proposal, but now you're, it's maybe a little bit more fleshed out if you're going to be included in a chapter. Yeah, because, and the chapter is just to give the agent and the editor a sense of your narrative voice. So you're not writing the whole book. You're basically saying, here's what the book would sound like. Right. And okay. I've actually, I've done that, like this book and my next book uh, for the same publisher, I did that. And I'm trying to do the same thing with this memoir thing. Now it's once you get, and a lot of my clients, right? I, I rep a lot of nonfiction clients and with KidLit, the proposals are a bit smaller. Um, I was actually weirdly, I was like the number three KidLit nonfiction agent at the end of last year, which goes to show how little nonfiction is selling <laughs> because it's like, you know, we're a tiny agency. We haven't sold that much, but um, it's the same thing. It's just a little shorter. Mm. But I really love it because it's it's the next step from what you're talking about, the magazine pitches where you're, you know, it's often just a, what you're talking about is often a single conversation or a single email where you're just saying, here's the pitch. Do you want to buy the piece? It's yeah. just a bigger version of that. Okay. Yeah. And then is like I had been reading about, uh, you know, like American publishers and then British publishers and is there information on picking the publisher picking like you had mentioned like Rootledge and I think Rootledge oh. is probably for me yeah because I do a lot of academic work Rootledge would be but it's also kind of a stuffy kind of yeah and it is more academic -y. I think yeah. I mean again you don't need an agent for this I I mean one of some of the feedback I got when I submitted my proposal to agents was you don't really need an agent for this. You could either self-pub or you could go straight to one of the um, editors. And I actually pitched Susan Rabiner herself and she said, you know, I don't think you need an agent for this. Here's the editors I would have taken it to if I did rep you. Um, the university presses that have good trade arms in the States are University of California, University of Chicago and Ohio University, which can be a little 
picky. But then there's a bunch of, you know, smaller nonfiction presses. Um, I think Catapult has, I think they have an imprint that does the more journalistic nonfiction stuff. So it's really just a question of Googling. Yeah, I think that's a really great question because we'll have, um, you know, authors in your position, Jenny, who are doing nonfiction stuff, a lot of journalists who, you know, might want to expand some of their writing the way that um, Kathy Mexted did with the, the book that we just read in the Aviatrix Book Club, we read this um, book, Australian Women Pilots. Kathy is a journalist, um, but then she, she kind of adjusted her writing to tell the stories of 10 women aviation pioneers in Australia. And um, it, it, I just did an interview with her. It's, it's really great oh, to hear kind of how, how she had to transition from that sort of journalistic to a more narrative style in her writing. Yes and then get it published. It was, it was great. Yeah. Well, I wanna make sure that everyone's questions have been answered uh, for Jackie, either in terms of uh, literary agent, publishing, um, or any legal, any last legal questions. Does anyone have anything else for her? Just one quick, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, it's great. Well, no, so, and I, I do remember her saying when you do want an agent is for, it depends on the type of book. Can you give me just a quick example of something that would be good where you would be looking for an agent? And, wait, wait. and Jackie, go be specific. I think Sarah is a writer for children and young adults. So um, I am under the, so we have Sid who seems to have been very successful in getting her book into classrooms um by self-publishing and uh sarah has self-published and i have been under the sort of um mantra that if i want to reach the classroom and librarians um and and parents that i need to go the self or the traditional publishing route so in that context what are your thoughts it really, really, I have a friend down in Texas who, you know, was so frustrated with not being able to get an agent that she started her own publishing company. So not only does she self-publish, but she publishes other people's books now and she gets them into all the classrooms. Um, they're all picture books. Um, I think if you're entrepreneurial, it doesn't make a huge difference. I mean, it goes a little bit back to your question earlier. What's the pitch for why do I want an agent? I mean, I think agents are helpful in terms of helping manage a career, you know, helping bounce ideas off what's, you know, what's a good way to go forward with this project, what should the next project be, obviously with the legal stuff, you know, you don't have to worry about getting a lawyer to look at your contract and I think you maybe get a bit of an advantage in negotiations if someone's going into bat for you and they know that they're dealing with an agent and not an author who may not know as much about legal stuff um i have you know i've had people sign with me for various reasons i've i've had i mean i do really well actually weirdly i think because i'm a lawyer and i i like thinking about the business side of stuff as much as i like editing or more so i do really well with clients who've actually started out their careers and then and either haven't had an agent and have gone Hmm, maybe it's time I have an agent or have had an agent. It didn't work out. A lot of them had adult agents and moved into kidlit and wanted someone more kidlit focused. Um, and those people are looking for someone who can just sort of help them navigate their career and make sure that, you know, when they sign a contract, they're carving out options and non-competes so that contract doesn't interfere with the next thing they want to do. I think if you're talking about there's this one project I want to do and what's the best way to proceed with it and you're not really thinking about career management and you're not really thinking about I really want someone looking out for my legal interests, um, probably it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. And I mean, not all agents manage careers. Like I like doing that. Um, Kelly and Courtney and Laurie like doing that. We have close professional relationships with all our clients. That's why we want to keep the agency small. We like that. Um, my agent is not like that at all. She has a huge number of clients and all she does is deals. 
you know, you give her the thing, it's ready to go and she'll go and make a deal on it. She doesn't want to talk to you about, you know, your vision for your future. So it, it also depends on the agent as well. Um, but, you know, I think, I think you avoid potholes, pitfalls, if you have a partner that you're working with who really understands. And, you know, if you are thinking traditional publishing and you're looking for editorial help, well, you get, you know, a lot of agents in KidLit are editorial and help you edit. And we're also pretty good at knowing who would be a good editor. So, so like if you're self-publishing, you just have to find those people yourself and they're out there and they're available. And I can recommend really good ones too, if people are thinking of self-publishing and you'd like an edit from someone who's a professional um, editor, which I highly recommend if you're, I think it's essential if you're self-publishing, um, mm. but you get all that built in if you work with an agent because you have the editorial help in house and you have an agent who cares about which editor you ultimately work with and make sure, and, and make sure nothing's going off the tracks. You know, like once my clients are working with editors, I'm copied on what's happening. I'm not interfering, but I know what's going on. So I can see if a problem is going to arise. You mentioned the word non-compete. So that piqued my interest. Mm. So does a publishing house put in a non-compete as oh, yeah. far as, what does that mean exactly as far as in writing? Like, so like for Fly Girl, they couldn't have another Fly Girl? No, you can't write something that's going to compete with that book for a oh. publisher. All right, but not the other way around. So they could publish another Fly Girl if they wanted to, right? Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't because it would be silly. And yes. Often you'll have the editor say, ah, you know, I love this, but I've got something too similar on my list. But yeah, I mean, that would be stupid for them. But what they're saying is that I want you interfering with their market for your book. Okay, thanks. Jackie, you know, I'm definitely going to wrap things up here pretty quickly, but, but you, you mentioned this earlier about a book that you looked at that was similar to something that was already on the market and there was no way you were going to sell it. That is contrary to everything that, um, that I intuitively think about as a reader. You know, uh, if I read a book in a genre and I enjoy it, and this is kind of like my sales pitch for cross-promoting within the, the books about women in aviation. Like if you're somebody who read a book about an aviation topic and you enjoyed yeah. it, this is not aren't what I'm you somebody? About. No, no, I'm talking about a very, very specific picture book topic that's focused. You know how picture books obvious, often focus on a particular object? Like it might be a book about, I don't know, because, you know, if I say what it is, you'll know what the book is. But if, if the whole book revolves around a child's relationship to... How about The Giving Tree? Let's go The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Right. So if it was another book about, um, yeah, like a, a kid's relationship to a tree that, yeah, I mean, it would be that close. I'm talking about something that close really mm -hmm. i'm not talking about obviously you want to sell something that has comps in the market you want to be able to say my book will appeal to the readers of this i do that all the time it's one of my favorite in fact i wrote a blog post on comp titles so you should all read it i had a lot of fun writing it um it's really important to be able to say if you liked blah you'll like my book but sometimes with picture books the story by through no fault of the author is you know is just too close to the exact story of another book because it's so compressed and if you're talking about exactly the same thing and the other book's done really well and you know we've even honestly had editors and this is not the situation of that book we've had situations with editors where I've gone out with a picture book about the you know the multiracial experience being a multiracial child and an editor will say, well, we already have a book by blah, blah, blah. That's our multiracial book. You know, it's, it's about being multiracial. I mean, editors will say, because picture books are expensive. And 
I totally disagree with saying, well, we have the multiracial book, so we don't need another one. But I, I do think what you're talking about is different to what I'm talking about because picture books is just such a specific thing. They're expensive. They, you know, you don't get a lot of repeat sales. Like, okay, so so that's good news for me because yes. you know Sid's book is a, about a teenage girl who learns how to fly. And I'm writing a book about a teenage girl who learns yeah. how to fly. <laughs> I'm oh, not going to title it Fly Girl, but, but I would I'm like to know that. that, you know, somebody, like a, you come a, a, a publisher, you're like, nope, there's already a book like no, that. We don't want no, anymore. No, I'm really, <laughs> I mean, weirdly, I cannot explain this because I am not remotely trained in picture books. I didn't in my, I did a three year internship at another agency. And then I worked after that at a different agency. I never worked on picture books in the last 12 months. Everything I've sold has been a nonfiction middle grade YA or a picture book. Like I'm trained in novels. I think the novel market took a little bit of a hit in middle grade and YA during the pandemic and is coming back now. Um, so yes, I, all of my recent sales are picture books, which is bizarre because, you know, I don't, I mean, I think my website says I don't rep them and I obviously do because that's all I've sold for the last year. But, and I do have some clients now who write only picture books, but initially it was, I had novelist clients who, would you look at my picture book? And it's like, so, because you do them more quickly and then you get them out on sub while you're still working on the novel. Um, yeah, so I'm really talking about a very, very specific thing. Okay, that's good news. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for thank your you. time. It's been wonderful. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And thanks to the other ladies on the call. A couple had to drop off, but thanks for being here um, because you know having the broad perspective and experience really enriches the conversation. And hopefully this will be of use to some of our other writers who are aspiring to get published. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to catch up and uh, you, people have my submission thing if anyone ever wants to submit to me. But you know, my door is open if folks have questions. So do let me know. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.